Breaking tonight, Israel retaliates, launching airstrikes at Iran. We will do whatever necessary to defend the state of Israel. This after Iran fired ballistic missiles at Israel weeks ago, the direct attack fueling fears of a wider war. A shocking daytime killing in an Ottawa park labeled a femicide. I'm uh, broken my heart. I'm not good, you know, very sad. A mother stabbed in front of her young children. The tragic connection between the victim and the accused. One year after Matthew Perry's death, his family opens up. You know, one of those moments you don't forget. His stepfather, Canadian journalist Keith Morrison, on the moment they learn it was criminal. The venality of some of these professionals is just, it still shocks me. And Perry's legacy here in Canada. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. And we begin tonight with breaking news. After weeks of tension, violence, and uncertainty in the Middle East, Israel says it's striking Iran directly. Israel had promised to respond to Tehran's missile attack on October 1st, and tonight the military says it has taken action. Right now, the Israel Defense Forces is conducting precise strikes on military targets in Iran. That rumble believed to be air defense is trying to stop Israeli missiles in the sky above Iran's capital. Senior correspondent Susan Ormison joins us now with the latest. And Susan, what do we know at this point? Ian, as you just heard, Israel confirmed it had attacked targets in Iran. The Iranian news agency says multiple pre-dawn explosions were heard over Tehran, with attacks aimed at military bases in the west and southwest of the capital. Israeli officials say there were three waves of strike and that the operation is now over. The response came after months of continuous attacks from the regime. White House officials say Washington was alerted shortly before Israel launched those airstrikes, but says it had no involvement. We are told both President Biden and Kamala Harris have been briefed on the developing situation and are being updated. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken had just arrived back from the Middle East, where he had urged Israel, if it attacked, to respond in a measured way and to exclude nuclear sites. The Israeli spokesperson for the IDF, Daniel Hagari, had more on the attacks this evening. The regime in Iran and its proxies in the region have been relentlessly attacking Israel since October 7th on seven fronts, including direct attacks from Iranian soil. Like every other sovereign country in the world, the state of Israel has the right and the duty to respond. Our defensive and offensive capabilities are fully mobilized. We will do whatever necessary to defend the state of Israel and the people of Israel. Iran and Iraq have canceled flights for now, and Syrian state TV is reporting explosions near Damascus and in central Syria. And this strike, Susan, or some sort of conduct has been expected now for some time. It has. Some retaliation had been widely expected, Ian, after a series of tit-for-tat attacks between Israel and Iran, going back now to April. And that was all heightened after Iran's military strike against Israel just three weeks ago. What happens next will depend in part on what was hit, reportedly not oil fields or nuclear sites. But Iranian sources say the country is prepared to respond to Israeli aggression. There are no reports yet of casualties. Clearly, this is an alarming development which risks inflaming the Middle East even more after tonight. Senior correspondent Susan Ormiston watching this developing news for us. Let's turn to news here in Canada. Ottawa police have arrested and charged a man with first-degree murder for allegedly stabbing a mother to death while she watched her children play at the park, a killing they're now calling a femicide. It happened at the suburban playground in the city's south end. Neighbors heard the screams and ran to the children, shocked at the sudden, brutal attack. They saw a man fleeing to his car moments later. Police said she was killed because of her gender. Beyond that, they gave few details on motive, but those who knew the victim and her family told our reporter, Robin Miller, more. A wave of grief after an act of violence that's left people shocked and shattered. 
She was very kind. She was very nice. No. The bad day. I didn't sleep last night. Um, every time I, my room is there, and then I, I saw yesterday how that lady on the ground, and it's hard to move on. The stabbing happened in broad daylight. The victim, a mother, at the park with her two young children. Brikti Belhe was 36 years old. I am uh, broken my heart. I am not good, you know, very sad, sad, sad. Helen Kabade is a good friend. Hearing the news was unbearable. She says the victim knew the accused, that Berhe's aunt had recently left a relationship with him and was staying with her. She's sweet girl, she's nice girl. For me, she's nice, but I don't know what happened. The accused is 36-year-old Fasa Tekle from Montreal. Community members confirmed that images on a Facebook account match his appearance Minutes after the killing, the account, which uses a different name, posted one word in Amharic, meaning done. He was arrested thanks to neighbors who jumped into action. Witnesses provide crucial information that led to the sus suspect's arrest and also showed incredible compassion in trying to protect the young children at the scene. Police wouldn't give details on the motive beyond calling it a femicide, the second murder they've designated with that term. These homicides are, you know, women who are killed by men because they are women. And I know that um, traditionally we would all jump straight to the conclusion that they must be in a, an intimate relationship, but that's not always the case. For some now, Berhe's killing is a call to action. It's beyond. And I, I don't know how many people are going to have to die in such tragic ways in, until something changes. So still very raw emotions in the community tonight. All throughout the evening, people have been coming by to lay flowers here and remember and honour Berhe. There is also talk of a community vigil being held here next Tuesday. And as we heard in your story, Robin, uh, people uh, mentioning the need for change. Yeah, certainly. And City Council here in Ottawa declared intimate partner violence an epidemic last year, and Ottawa police have really taken that to heart, hence their use of the term femicide. They're also working uh, in collaboration with agencies who are trying to help. Police say that all levels of government and the public need to work together to solve this crisis. Robin Miller reporting tonight from Ottawa. The lawyer representing a Canadian woman detained in Syria wants answers tonight after she died in Turkey. The details that led to her death, including her escape from an ISIS detention camp, are murky. But as Ashley Burke explains, she leaves behind six children here in Canada. This lawyer says the Canadian mother of these six children was found dead abroad. And Lawrence Greenspan blames the government. This was a completely unnecessary, tragic death. Canada repatriated the woman's four boys and two girls in May from this detention camp in northeastern Syria. It's where ISIS suspects and their families are held, but the government refused to bring home the mother too. If global affairs had permitted uh, mother to be repatriated with her children, uh, she would still be very much alive today. He says the Canadian government told him it wouldn't help get her out of this camp because she posed a security risk. So he says she somehow escaped in March to try and get herself home. In June, she was arrested in Turkey, charged with being a member of a terrorist organization. On October the 15th, she went through a trial in Turkey and was acquitted of the charge. And within 48 hours, uh, it was reported back to us that she had died uh, in her cell in an immigration facility. I think what has happened to her is a dramatic wake-up call. This human rights lawyer was part of a delegation that visited the mother and her children last year at the camp. She herself had made it very clear that in Canada, through a legal process, she would be more than will willing to address any accusations and allegations against her through a fair legal process, but the government refused to do that. Some say the government's refusal is telling. 
she could have been capable or intending to carry out an attack in Canada, or even at a, a slightly lower threshold, that she was still very radicalized within the Islamic State jihadist ideology and could influence other people here on Canadian soil. There's never been any evidence to come forward to substantiate any allegations of that sort. Global Affairs Canada said it's in contact with local authorities in the region, but won't share any other information citing privacy concerns. The department also didn't respond to the allegation that it's to blame. Actually, some of those involved are now calling for action. Yeah, and human rights lawyer Alex Neve is among those who've written a letter to the Foreign Affairs Minister saying that they want for Canada to call for an independent investigation into this death. They say that it raises troubling questions like how it's possible that a 40-year-old suddenly died just days after this acquittal. He says the women's children will want to know those answers. Ashley Burke reporting from Ottawa tonight. In the U.S., there are multiple reports Chinese hackers targeted both presidential campaigns. American news outlets reporting a broad hacking campaign against telecommunications networks. The phones of Donald Trump and his running mate J.D. Vance apparently targeted. And someone affiliated with the Kamala Harris campaign was also a target. Authorities informed the campaigns this week and investigations are on ongoing. It's not clear whether the hackers got access to any data. Tonight, both candidates are focused on Texas, not a swing state, but Texas is a backdrop for Trump and Harris to illustrate their key issues in a race that national polls suggest is essentially a tie. And as Chris Reyes shows us, there is a clear split between male and female voters. It's good to be in Texas. Please welcome. Texas is no battleground. We're here today in the great state of Texas. The state has voted Republican for president for seven straight elections. Yet in these crucial last days before the vote, both candidates are choosing to be there, hoping to reach very different voters. Harris is holding a rally in Houston with a hometown celebrity, Beyonce, and talking about abortion rights. Sadly, um, the elected leaders of Texas, a lot of them, have made Texas ground zero in this fundamental fight for the freedom of women to make decisions about their own body. Trump sat down with mega popular podcast host Joe Rogan at his Austin studio and spent time with border agents talking about his signature platform. We will end this migrant invasion and we will deport every last criminal alien targeting our daughters and our children, and our families, other people's families. They're gonna be gone, they're gonna be gone fast. With Beyonce's massive female fan base and Rogan's predominantly young male listeners, another clear difference, their choice of audience. It's legitimate that we have a gender gap that has never been this large in modern American politics. If you're under age 30 and you're a woman, you are absolutely voting for Harris. If you're male, you're voting for Trump. Trump and Harris taking a brief break from battleground campaigning to double down on their bases. Showing up in Texas, caring about Texas women, is the message that she's going to send. What Kamala Harris has done on our border is cruel, it's vile, and it's absolutely heartless. A battle of messages in the final bid to reach voters, with the candidates still neck and neck in the polls. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. President Joe Biden made a historic formal apology to Native Americans for their treatment under a forced boarding school policy. Susanna De Silva looks at the significance of the apology and the timing. Joe Biden did what no president has done before. I formally apologize as President of the United States of America for what we did. Recognizing the harms caused to indigenous children by government boarding schools. From the early 1800s to 1870, to 1970, one of the most horrific chapters in American history. You should be ashamed. Biden's administration conducted a three-year investigation documenting the more than 400 schools where children were forcibly taken from their families to assimilate them. At least close to 1,000 children died. Interior Secretary Deb Holland's grandparents were survivors. And I acknowledge that this trauma was perpetrated by the agency that I now lead. Many Americans are unfamiliar with the history, with many boarding schools closing by the 30s. Some U.S. Indigenous leaders say the discovery of possible unmarked school graves in Canada and the U.S. has pushed the conversation forward. It 
puts the blame on the federal government, which a lot of Native families, communities have wanted for a long time. It gets it out there. It makes it a part of the official record. I think most of us feel good if we feel we've been wronged and someone apologizes. But most of us know that the behavior has to change. We, an apology is kind of a starting point for a new relationship. A new relationship dealing with issues like future land rights. Not lost on anyone, the looming election, the apology delivered in the swing state of Arizona. Native Americans constitute about 5% of the electorate in Arizona. That might not sound like a lot, but this is a state that Biden won by 0.36 percentage points in 2020. So 5% of the electorate can make a difference. But indigenous communities are hoping this apology has more than political consequences. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. King Charles opened his first Commonwealth summit as Britain's head of state by acknowledging its colonial past, but he didn't apologize for the UK's role in the slave trade. I understand from listening to people across the Commonwealth how the most painful aspects of our past continue to resonate. It is vital, therefore, that we understand our history to guide us to make the right choices in the future. 56 countries make up the Commonwealth and some leaders want to talk about reparations. While Charles didn't address it and the UK Prime Minister has ruled out payments, the PM is reportedly open to reparations like debt relief. Doctors in Alberta say a rare infection spread through some organ transplants. It was quite uh, alarming to us. We were surprised to see that type of infection. What the patients all had in common. Next. Paper bags are making a comeback at the checkout, and some say that's a problem. There's still unintended uh, environmental consequences. And splashdown, finally, the space crew back on Earth after weeks of delays. We're back in two. The Israel Defense Forces is conducting precise strikes on military targets in Iran. Confirmation from Israel tonight that it has launched airstrikes against Iran, retaliation in part for Iran's missile attacks on Israel earlier this month. The IDF released this video of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu along with his defense minister and chief of defense staff while the initial attacks were underway. Seven people in Alberta contracted a disease that's rare in Canada. They got it after an organ transplant. Now doctors say it came from their organ donors who are experiencing homelessness. Julia Wong explains how it happened and why advocates say this is a wake-up call. It's a disease found in cramped, unsanitary conditions like refugee camps. But Bartonella Quintana caused by body lice and sometimes called trench fever, has been found in Alberta. Seven organ transplant recipients since 2022 have been treated by this doctor. It was quite uh, alarming to us. We were surprised to see that type of infection. It shows up as skin lesions. The disease came from their organ donors, all of whom were experiencing homelessness and had been infected. So this is new. If it's been described, it's been described extremely rarely, maybe once before. But for some, this discovery is no surprise. Advocates say there are few hygiene facilities for people to turn to. Lack of access to basic hygiene is a huge barrier and probably one of the biggest risk factors uh, because really to, to treat or get rid of body lice, really someone just needs to shower, change their clothes. The disease can be treated with antibiotics, and all the patients have recovered. Still, this expert says more information about donors is needed. We don't intend for uh, these cases to limit organ transplantation. But what we hope is that donors who have risk factors for Bartonella Quintana um, are recognized early so that people might know that the recipients may be at increased risk. Especially because doctors believe this could become more common. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, more donors uh, that die from uh, overdose. And um, these individuals, uh, because of their addiction, sometimes these individuals uh, are unhoused or they don't have stable housing. Um, so they are at more risk of uh, getting infected. 
Alberta Health Services, which runs the province's transplant program, tells CBC News it's now screening unhoused donors and testing recipients several times after their transplant. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Walmart is phasing out its reusable bags and bringing back the old classic. How many bags you got? Uh, probably about 20 bags. Why some say paper is still a problem. Next. Plus the battle over bike lanes in Ontario. We need to and will remove and replace existing bike lanes on primary roads. Will ripping them up really solve gridlock? And Matthew Perry's family is ready to share their story, including his final moments with his mother. He seemed, he seemed very happy. Others have said the same thing. He seemed so happy uh, and content. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Rescue workers in the Philippines digging through mud and rubble to retrieve bodies in the wake of tropical storm Trami. That storm caused flooding and landslides, killing more than 80 people and forcing tens of thousands to flee their homes. Although Trami has moved on, forecasters worry the storm could turn back to the Philippines again next week. And splashdown. After nearly eight months at the International Space Station, four astronauts returned to Earth today, two months later than expected. They were delayed because of problems with the Boeing Starliner spacecraft. The two astronauts from the Starliner remain stuck at the space station. They'll stay there until February. Love, exciting and new, come aboard. We're expecting you. Jack Jones, the Grammy-winning baritone behind the Love Boat theme song, has died. Jones began as a nightclub singer in the 50s and won a couple of Grammys in the 60s. The crooner passed away in hospital this week after a two-year battle with leukemia. He was 86. When Canadian retailers were forced to stop using plastic bags, it created a new problem. Many of us have more reusable bags than we could ever need. Now some stores are turning to paper bags, but as Sophia Harris shows us, they're not necessarily better for the environment. Following complaints about reusable Walmart blue bags piling up in homes, the retailer is switching to paper bags. So how many bags you got? Uh, probably about 20 bags from the, our last delivery here. Walmart grocery delivery customer Steve Calarco has already collected hundreds of these. He recycles them, but feels this isn't the best move for the environment. Probably 40% of the bags that I get have got some sort of a rip in them, so they're not going to be reusable. Canada bans single-use plastic bags in 2022. As a result, some retailers are turning to single-use paper bags. Ontario's main liquor retailer, the LCBO, used to offer paper bags and will soon reintroduce them for customer convenience. Walmart says its bags are made with recycled content. Even so... There's still unintended uh, environmental consequences. This environmental expert says recycled paper is better than plastic, which can contaminate the environment. Still, it's not a sustainable solution. There's the energy costs uh, during uh, the pulp and paper making process, lots of chemicals and effluent-based uh, emissions. Plus, not every paper bag gets a second life. Environment Canada estimates only 55% of all paper waste is recycled. That's not the closed loop uh, uh, that we envision. The Yukon has banned both plastic and paper bags. The territory says trucking in paper bags from other regions is bad for the environment. It's over 2,000 kilometers, and that's a big impact on the greenhouse gas emissions. And the paper bag is just another single-use item. Some grocers provide bagless delivery by using reusable cardboard boxes or plastic bins. I think that's a fantastic solution. Walmart says it continues to explore more sustainable solutions. However, there are no federal rules preventing retailers from doling out paper bags. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. Now it's time to dig deeper into the story shaping our world. A year after Matthew Perry's death, his family still copes with the loss. You know, one of those moments you don't forget. A conversation about moving forward from personal tragedy. But first. 
the push to take back bike lanes in Ontario. We need to and will remove and replace existing bike lanes on primary roads. Cycling advocates oppose the change, but the province appears unmoved. Jeff Casello is a professor in the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo, and Oris Soltakevich is a cyclist in Edmonton. And Jeff, let me begin with you. You are in Ontario, and what's your reaction to the Premier's plan to, to remove some of the bike lanes in Toronto? Yeah, it's a, it's a very curious decision, and the plan is, I think, it's fair to say, contrary to where the planning profession, the transportation profession has been going. We've been working for decades to try and diversify our transportation activity, moving away from private automobiles towards more sustainable modes that are more accessible, more available to a greater segment of the population. And so uh, bicycles are certainly an important part of that planning. It's been, you know, all over Canada. It's been in Montreal and in Edmonton. Um, investments have been being made. So really, this is a, a very different step um, here in Ontario than, than what's happening not just in Canada but around the world. And speaking of Edmonton, Orest, that's where you are. You're a retired teacher, a cyclist, somebody who has written and obviously thought about the issues of cyclists uh, on the roads. From afar, how do you feel about uh, Ford's plan? Well, I, uh, I'm familiar with Bloor Street, but I can compare it to Jasper Avenue here in Edmonton, which is our main sort of east-west thoroughfare through our downtown. We don't have a bike lane on Jasper Avenue, but our city put in a bike lane one block south of Jasper Avenue, and it stretches for about a kilometer and a half. And I use it uh, at least once a week, and it's very well organized in that uh, there's a dedicated bike lane going both ways, and there's traffic lights dedicated to bicyclists. So it's uh, very, very well planned and very easy to use. And uh, I, think it's, uh, I, think it's, I think it's very successful. You know, when I, when I think of Edmonton, it's a city I visit quite a bit. I, I think of, you know, big, long commutes a lot of people take, often in vehicles. I think of a place that gets really cold in the winter. Orst, what's it like to be a, a cyclist in Edmonton? Well, in uh, summer, I think it's great. I think we have excellent weather. But I think what's happening in winter cycling is with the advent of fat bikes, and especially with the advent of e-bikes, it's becoming more and more easier to cycle in winter. And our city of Edmonton made quite an effort to make uh, bike lanes, the more popular ones, cleared every winter. So within 24 hours after it snows, there's a real solid attempt to get those cleared. So I think our city is going uh, in the right way in that regard. Jeff, presumably Premier Ford thinks there's political support for his plan. So I wonder, as somebody with expertise in planning, what do you think needs to be done to, to get more public support, more political support for more bike lanes? Yeah, you know, I, I think that this is a very much a populist agenda and it's, um, you know, it's not inconsistent with the way this government has operated. Um, there is this horrible con congestion problem. All of us agree, every transportation professional agrees that there's a horrible congestion problem in Toronto and the greater Toronto area. And it's very easy to be alone in your car and looking at this bike lane and watching people pass you in the bike lane and think, well, if that bike lane weren't there, I would be able to, to travel more quickly. But that's simply not true. This, this sense that there is a dichotomy that bike lanes necessarily create congestion for autos is just not true. The data are evident that that's the case. And so this is, again, as I said earlier, just a, a really curious decision, and it's just inconsistent with best practices. Um, I think that we definitely have to address the congestion problem, but removing bike lanes isn't the solution. Jeff, I think if I talked to any planner, they would give us that answer, that it seems pretty clear that the planning community supports more bike lanes. But I guess I get back to my question. What do you think it's yes, going to right. take to sell this to people, to, to, make, to get broad public support for more bike lanes, even in a congested city like Toronto? Yeah, so I think uh, there is a very strong po uh, proportion of the population who already do cycle. But our own data suggests that there is great support for cycling. Um, the Ontario, the, the Share the Road group in Ontario did a survey, and 70% of the respondents said that they would be interested in be supportive of more bicycle infrastructure. You know, the notion, again, is that we have to create spaces that are safe and accessible for people. And the more people that do travel, the better the experience is going to be for those who are traveling by bikes. And I think the population is ready for that change. There is a small subset of, of ardent drivers who are going to, you know, 
fight any kind of reduction in, in space dedicated to the cars between the curves. But that's not the reality of the situation. I think there's an educational component. I think there is a public outreach component. I do think we need those who are supportive of bike lanes to be more vocal outside of the planning and the professional community, because I do think that there is a large proportion of the population who are prepared to support these bike lanes. And again, I don't think this proposal by the Premier really resonates with the community here in Ontario. And Oris, you make an interesting point that uh, it's not good enough just to have a bike lane. It needs to be a useful bike lane, and that's not always the case in Edmonton. That's correct. The bike lane that I was describing earlier is very successful. We have pretty, uh, I'm not sure what the term would be, but very unsuccessful bike lanes in that they, instead of being bike lanes where commuters can use, they seem to have been designed like obstacle courses. A little bit left, a little bit right, go up a little bit by the bus stop, go down. And really, if you travel faster than five or 10 kilometers an hour, you're asking for trouble. A very, very poorly designed bike lanes. And I understand why people would be upset. The bike lane is put in front of their house. It's hard to park. And you can sit out in the front window and maybe one or two bikes per hour. So very poorly designed and very poorly placed. The particular ones that I'm thinking of were placed on a, res I don't know, a fairly residential street where there's very little traffic. And, and it seems that cars and bikes could fairly easily share the road there. So yes, there we have very good bike lanes in Edmonton and we have some quite poorly designed ones. Well, there is a better way, and we'll see if uh, Canadian cities are willing to, to go there. Orest and uh, Jeff, thank you very much for speaking with us this evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you. 25 years after The Tipping Point became a best-selling sensation, Malcolm Gladwell has written Revenge of The Tipping Point. Here's part of my conversation with him. Based on what you've observed in the world and the rules and, and the guidelines of how things change, how can we create a less polarized, less angry society. There was a, some really fascinating analysis done during COVID of all of the anti-vaccine, um, that movement. There were three sources for something like 70% of the, of the anti-vax information online. That tells us that sometimes what we perceive to be as a broad-based movement is not. It is a movement that's being fueled by a very small number of people who have managed to amplify their voice. And I think that helps us to put what looks like division into some perspective. I suspect that a lot of what we feel is, uh, is division is not actually division. You can catch my full interview with Malcolm Gladwell this Sunday right here on The National. Up next, almost a year after Matthew Perry's death, the family of the Friends star is speaking publicly. I can't imagine the anger you must have felt. It's such a familiar thing. A conversation with Perry's stepfather, the Canadian journalist Keith Morrison, is after the break. Matthew Perry's family breaks their public silence nearly a year after the actor's death. Ask any mother what it's like to, to lose a child. It doesn't matter whether he's you know, five or 55. Recounting the emotional toll of the loss and Perry's last contact with his mother. Tom Power, host of the CBC radio program Q, sat down with Perry's stepfather, the Canadian journalist, Keith Morrison. Keith, um, where, uh, where were you when you found out Matthew had oh. passed? <laughs> Suzanne and I were walking the dog. We're walking through uh, some brush on a you know, one of those moments you don't forget. And um, her phone rang, and it was his assistant calling. Um, and he said in a kind of a strange and strangled voice, you better sit down. And she said, what are you talking about? I'm walking the dog. And then it was just, he announced, Matthew's dead. Matthew's dead. Um, and, you know, kind of, a brief explanation before he hung up and um uh, well ask any parent who's lost a child ask you know it's one thing for me i'm his stepfather and you know we were we were close but i'm his stepfather i'm not i'm not his mother ask any mother what it's like to to lose a child it doesn't matter whether he's you know five or 55 it's 
uh, never goes away. You find out, and then what are the then the then the world finds out. Tributes are being paid this morning to the Friends actor Matthew Perry, who has died at the age of 54. What were the first few days like? I mean, to not just be dealing with this uh, tremendous personal loss, but to see the world sort of grieving it, people trying to figure, while you guys are trying to figure out answers, I'm sure, what exactly happened here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was... Uh... It was confusing, yeah. uh, a very, very confusing rush of different kinds of feelings, just, yeah, you know, from one to another to another. You're living in a different time, and then you're back in the prison, and then you're angry about something, and then you're, um, and then you're, you know, uh, everybody's sobbing, and then um, it, from one thing to another. Very, very confusing, and uh, physically as well, kind of debilitating. It was a, a strange time. And then we were amazed to see all this in incredible outpouring. It was, it was, you know, just another of the surprises where it came to Matthew. We charge five defendants in this matter. These defendants, took advantage of Mr. Perry's addiction issues to enrich themselves. What, what's, been your, um, what's been your reaction to seeing Matthew's death become a criminal investigation? Um, well, I, it, it, social media was full of suggestions that I had something to do with it, which I did not, not even a little bit. Um, but they decided that this was a case that they should pursue, partly because, you know, some of these people who were in a position of trust betrayed their trust. And, uh, and partly, I think, to send a message to medical professionals and others, you know, don't do that sort of thing and make an example of them because, uh, I mean, the abuse of opioids and ketamine and God knows what else in America is uh, beyond a reckoning. I don't even know if you can keep track of it all. It's, it's, there's, it's so bad. Uh, so I talk about our story, but our story is just one of millions of stories. I think this is, I don't know anyone in Canada who has not gone through something like this. And the feeling that I get from those who are left behind, those who are uh, family members, those who are friends of the people that have have died of overdose or that, you know, died, died of drug abuse, is a tremendous anger, an anger at the people who might have supplied, uh, the anger at, at, at doctors, anger at, at drug dealers, anger at middlemen. And you have this... Um, you know, this, you have this journalistic way about you of covering crime mm. and journalistic way about you of, of covering um, stuff mm. like this. But, Keith, I can't imagine the anger you must have felt. It's such a familiar thing. Um, I've, I've sat across from probably literally thousands of people over the years who have felt that very anger and talk about it and describe it describe what they went through, what they would like to see happen um, to whoever did a bad thing to their loved one. Um, and so I guess my perspective is a little bit different. Um, it, it's really more Susanna's fury. Yeah, she is. At, especially at, at, the, at the people who, would, who were trusted more than anyone else. I, I'm just... I'm very sad and not surprised. Uh, the venality of some of these professionals is just, it still shocks me. And yet I hear about it again and again and again and again. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised his mom was, his, his mom is raging. Like I'm not surprised there's a, there's a furiousness yeah. there. They had become very, very close again after some awkward years, I won't lie. Um, and she, just a couple of days before she died, before he died, um, she was she spent the day with him, 
And um, they had, she said, one of the sweetest days that they'd had together in a long time. And uh, he seemed, he seemed very happy. Others have said the same thing. He seemed so happy uh, and content. And actually said to her, and I'm probably telling tales out of school here, but uh, said, you know, that he, he isn't afraid to die anymore. Really? I think he was relating that to his, uh, to the fact that he was able to get it all out in a book and go and tell people about it. And he, he, it wasn't a shameful secret anymore. And, and people hadn't yeah. reacted negatively as he must have feared that they might, uh, that they'd embraced him instead and, and been sympathetic. And in fact, uh, you know, it was a triumph. And, and I think that gave him a whole different way of looking at his mortality. Tom, of course, you interviewed Matthew Perry and had a private chat with him before the cameras rolled, and, and you got a chance to tell Keith Morrison about that. Yeah, I mean, when I first met Matthew Perry, I remember I went to the backstage of the area where I was interviewing him, and he didn't know me, and I introduced myself, and I told him that I worked for the CBC, and he just lit up. I remember he told me that his mom worked for the news, she worked for Global for a while, she was press secretary and assistant to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, and I just remember there was so much pride in his voice, and I got to tell Keith, he talked to me about how proud he was of his mother, and he said, um, I will tell her that, and that's going to make her year. And there's a clip of Matthew telling you how uh, he wanted to be remembered, and, and again, you and Keith talked about that moment. Yeah, I remember that. You know, Matthew was talking to me about how he didn't care about Friends as his legacy or TV and movies as his legacy, that he wanted to be remembered for how many people he helped. And it got a, a big applause, right? But Keith told me he didn't just speak that way publicly. He told that to his family and his friends as well. So it makes sense they're doing this work to continue on the work he would have been doing in the new Matthew Perry Foundation. Both of those interviews, uh, so nice, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Thanks so much. And you can hear the full interview with Keith Morrison wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Q with Tom Power. Up next, a symphony performance that was robotic. The machine hitting the right notes in tonight's moment. That thing you're seeing around the cello isn't just holding it up, it's a robot and it's actually playing the instrument, accompanying a symphony orchestra in Sweden last week. In fact, the piece of music they played was specifically written for Robot by composer Jacob Mulrad and the robot's creator, Frederick Gran. And tonight, that collaboration is our moment. So this was actually the first time a robotic cello was playing with a full symphony orchestra. I got this crazy idea after seeing a robotic researcher called Fredrik Graham. He actually worked with um, two industrial robot arms that could play the cello. You know, musical notation is basically like code. So my musical notation actually became transcribed as code. So the robotic cello was actually playing like instantly from the score. The cello is, is fun because it's, it's physical movement creating the, the, the pitch, the tone. That's why I sort of do it more finding the characters of the different robotic arms and different yeah, technology. So it's a kind of a hip thing, like people are interested in it. So I'm very, it's, it's fun to find, the, find new collaborators like that. There is sort of a beauty seeing the machine and then seeing an instrument as beautiful as the cello. You are probably wondering, what's the Canadian connection to all of this? Well, Frederick, the robotic creator, actually studied composing at McGill University in Montreal. Well, for everyone here at The National, thanks for being with us. I hope you join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup. We have two topics. We're gonna to talk about the crisis in emergency departments across the country and about bicycle lanes. That'll be on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night, I'll be right here for The National. I hope you have a great Saturday.